Hello, good evening, and welcome to Fatback Four Daily Special um, with myself, Keith Plunkett. We're going to do something different today, and we thought we would move slightly away from the Liverpool angle and look at something that's having an impact on everyone really across the board, and that's the lockdown restrictions uh, due to COVID-19 and the impacts that it's having on skill boy or skill girl football. And I've got three excellent um, coaches and um, sports people in uh, in the Dublin Schoolboy District League region. Uh, I know we've a lot of listeners for that out in Dublin, but we said we'd stick to to the local lads here and we've three excellent people to talk. Um, first off, I'll introduce Gar Brain, no stranger to LFC Day Trippers fan from the club podcast. Gar, how are you? I'm all right, mate. Don't say that to Aldo. I said this was strictly non liberal <laughs> <laughs> we, we've, uh, we've established that one. We, we've got him on under false pretenses, but he's here now, so it's too late to back out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Gar, do you want to let the people know what your background is and um, how you're involved with with schoolboy coaching? Yeah, I've been involved with, with Home Farm now for nearly five years. You have to be coach, uh, strength and conditioning coach as well. And I, I currently help there with the Tour Danes. I've just finished up at the academy. Um, I helped out with the Tour Danes and currently helping the 11s with some online sessions as well. Uh, so that's more or less my, my background, lads. That's your story. <laughs> Big red book coming in. I had a few, ball, had a few battles with Al over the, over, over the last few years as well, and, and I've played against there him as well. Go. He's a bit of a hard one. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. So, uh, a nice little intro there we go. Allo, do you want to give us a few words on yourself? Yeah, well, like yourself, lads, I probably fell into grassroots coaching 20 years ago. I know you're saying he doesn't look old enough, but <laughs> yeah, I'm sure everyone's yeah. saying that. One of these kind of accidental academics and went to study sports science. So the undergrad sport science then run a master's in teaching. So currently working for the City of Dublin Education Training Board in sports science and coaching modules and the DOC at Lewis the Football Club and the UEFA B Lewis and Tolbert. So that's kind of where I'm at. But basically if someone asks me what I am, I'm like a grassroots coach that's what I am. That's, and that's what that's what I like to do, you know. Good stuff, good stuff. And Alan Doyle, what about yourself? This is your life, this is your moment. Liverpool's finest. Yeah. <laughs> well, the start of the United fans, <laughs> get that out, out, out the gate straight away. <laughs> On a Liverpool podcast, United fan. Now, uh, in terms oh, well. of grassroots football, I've been, uh, in terms of uh, uh, coaching, I've been involved with Malahoyed as a player and as a coach probably for the last 18 to 20 years uh, out there. So, um, a B license coach, I'm on the A license. I mean, I just finished the A license just before the lockdown to do a final assessment. Um, and that's where I am in, in terms of coaching. Um, in terms of Malahoy, I've been involved with a couple of different age groups. We're involved with the core deans at the minute, um, coaching with them and the eights as well, and a, a few other age groups as well. But, Across the board, be a pretty help out across as much as I can, look, you know. Excellent. Excellent stuff. So for anyone listening that wouldn't be familiar, like these would be be three big skillboy clubs in big catchment areas that would um have a good reach and would be very well known and reputable. So it's great to have the three lads on here and to get the the take. And just for clarification, Alo Bourne is an Aston Villa fan, so it's not all Liverpool today. So we've a, a nice mix. Alan, you're not on your own there as a man U fan. Um so lads as I said, myself and Gar were talking about sort of doing a pod on coaching um, and we, we thought, you know, with the kids being in lockdown, that would be, be good to get a check on about the, the difficulties that, you know, yourselves as coaches and how parents of young kids and even older sort of kids in this in the schoolboy sort of game might be impacted by the lockdown restrictions of COVID-19 and how it's impacting, you know, from the top the bottom to the very top, you know. So everyone, I think, is sort of feeling the pinch. So, um, you know, the impact, how he is finding them at his own clubs. I'll start with Alan Doyle. Alan, how are you finding it at Malahoy with this, the difficulties that you're coming across with your own team? It's a, the, the difficulties um, is you just don't know, you don't know where every, every, every kid is different and every situation is different so you have to try and have a broad base of what you're trying to do you try and engage as many kids as you're possible to try and be involved with, with what you're trying to do whether that be your s and c sessions or your running or whatever kind of sessions you're doing 
and it's it's difficult that that is a difficult part because you don't want it's a very difficult point for people to be going through parents and kids and you don't want to be pushing on top of what they're trying to do because you don't know what that what that what they're going through so it's it, that's that's the difficulty in it you know you can only try your best in what you're trying to do i mean we've had a good response from everything we've done in the club but it's, it's i suppose it's the soil and corner we always talk about in the club it's just when you have a group of 15 kids and 10 respond or 12 respond yeah. it's the other three that don't respond that you're more worried about than the 12 that do respond you know? yeah and i suppose in this current situation it's, it's even more of a of an issue you know when you're when you're dealing with kids face to face or you have them in in around the pitch and the club and you can spot these things this yeah. is just making it that bit harder isn't it from a yeah. distant sort of um learning um and Allo, what about yourself what about lords very similar to um, alan uh, it, it's like like you're saying that it's it's not that we worry about how to handle the situation when we come back because i think we, we know what to do we, we know how to set up sessions we know how to be challenging with our training sessions to help the kids learn the biggest impact I see is the, the societal impact in terms of if you think you're teenage teams, this is probably going to be their second recession and they're 16, 15, 16 year olds in the space of 10 years. So behind that, you've got parents that we don't know if they just lost their job. We don't know if it's had a strain on a relationship. So people don't see schoolboys have a big part, uh, schoolboy clubs have a big part to play and all that because we, we would spend a lot of time with, with the kids. So we're going to have to develop that empathy and, and that active listening side of things to kind of keep an eye on them when they do come back because there's going to be that rush to kind of focus on the fitness side of it or focus on the our, our systems and our styles of play. Realistically, we should be just focusing on letting the kids enjoy themselves for the first few weeks and getting back to what they want to do, play football, really. Yeah, couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. And I know it is a passion of yours. Um, Darren, what about you? I think Allo and, and I suppose Alan has said as well. I suppose kids' emotional intelligence is is going to be is, is going to be a big big eye opener at the moment because you're going to have a lot of kids, as the lads have said. Parents may have been let go from jobs. Uh, there's going to be pressures within the house. You're going to have kids who who have been totally knocked out of routine. You're going to have kids, you know, no 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 getting up at eight, eight o'clock or half seven in the mornings. So there are going to be kids who are having lions all morning, not eating properly. Let's not forget because they'll be getting up about 12 o'clock and probably having a pot noodle or so, so on and so forth and then not having a meal till eight o'clock at night because let's be honest, kids are allowed out a bit more now in their smaller groups so they're going to get out and you can't, you can't restrict them because otherwise they'll just end up going off the head with within their own homes and um, so there's a lot a lot of a lot of things i suppose socially uh, as Alo said that, that that are a worry at the moment and and how we i suppose touch on it again how we empathize with it how we sit back and and it is time like you know we can't when these boys come back we can't bombard them with, with instruction and you do this you do that because mm -hmm. They're not going to be, you know, we're nearly, what, three three months will, will be without football, more or less, more, yeah. more, four months. And it, it, there's not going to be that 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 memory retention, that, that, you know, the communication retention, everything like that. As Ella was is, is hitting on the head, you're going to have to allow them that sort of freedom to, to drop back into it, to enjoy it and, you know, and feed in because it's a, bi it's a big learner for us as well. Yeah, and it's nearly like a reset, isn't it? It's not like a normal kids go off and, you know, the season's over and they'll go off and do their thing. This has been different because with them being so restricted, it, it, they'd be nearly like caged animals, you know. Yeah, Alan, um, more anxious to get out and they'll be, you know, they haven't been able to keep fit. So I'm sort of thinking, Keaton's dodgy wife, is he? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think like he says, it, it is a challenge for us as well. Apologies, there. We haven't been through it, you know. Top down. Sorry about that. Um, how have you been keeping in touch with you at teams, and have you been uh, and keeping the mood of? Uh, possible during the lockdown like i know technology has just let me down there but which is ourselves has it been a help during this whole lockdown um hello yeah massive help yeah i think i think there's when we talk about covid19 and we talk about the, the implications of it we tend to bear towards the negative and it's hard not to 
because it is a very, very negative situation and people are losing their lives and we, we kind of tend to talk about football and forget that for a minute and think, gee, there's actually over a thousand people have passed away, you know? Yeah. Um, so in terms of technology, what, what we found really useful, we've used it for workshops, obviously, uh, we talked there about webinars and stuff. We've had we've had the event that's delivered a workshop for the club. So we've had one of their academy coaches deliver a workshop online. We've had a, a pal of mine, the coach in Iceland, he's come on and done a bit. So we've kind of looked at other cultures, how they're dealing with it. Um, for yeah. argument's sake, through, through the Icelandic one, we, we found out that from under 19s down, they're all back full contact training now. So the, the, they're back full contact training. So there's a, there's a complete difference uh, as regards to air roadmap to, to, to coming back to training. And their rationale being that they've no evidence to suggest that kids, the transmission between children is very is high enough to warrant no contact training. Yeah. So you learn little bits like that, you know. So um, WhatsApp obviously is a great thing for keeping in contact with our coaches and our parents. We use that a lot. But um, generally, like the lads have been saying, kind of webinar saturation would be the thing I'd say now at the moment. Um, as I said to Alan there before you pop, popped on there, Gar, we were saying how many webinars is too many webinars. It's, it's one of those yeah, things, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, nearly dead boy PowerPoint situation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. But well, it's been good, Keith. It's been without technology. I mean, uh, to add a bit of humor to it, if the if COVID nineteen had a hit when they had the original Nokia phones, I think we'd have all been goosed. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is actually, I know it, it is a very good point, but isn't it like the fact that we have got all the technology now that you can do this? Like as as you touched on there, Allo, you've had sessions delivered for Juventus and from Iceland. And it's something that wouldn't, you know, you're not going to get them popping over just to do a session with you, but you might be able to do it online and it's something to keep the kids interested. Um, Alan, what about yourself over the Malahoy? Do you much the same, doing the same sort of thing? Um, for, for the older age groups, actually, for the 13s, we had uh, six or seven games recorded and we actually signed them all up to, I have a huddle account and we signed them all up to huddle for match analysis. And uh, it's, do you know what, well, the first week when we signed them up, we done a Zoom call to try and talk. It's something we should have done probably the start of the year. Mm. And we were going to build into it. And then all this happened and it, 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 we signed them all at the huddle. So we we're trying to do Zoom calls to get them to know how to use it. But like five or six of them come back straight away. The stuff they came back with was, was kind of amazing. But their their vision of how they seen the game compared to what we were seeing was complete, but was, it was brilliant. It was something that we, uh, something that when we go back, we really have to push a lot more because what they're seeing compared to what you're seeing, and and their vision of how they see it is it's, it's brilliant. And the stuff they see that you don't give them enough credit for, essentially, um, or for how much they're taking in, or how much information they take on board is incredible. When they, when they give it back to you, and then you give them back little tips, that interaction is brilliant. But you always have to bear in mind the soil and corner in that, that there's some kids who don't give you back any information, very little, you know? So that's, but oh, it's been good. WhatsApp has been good. And I'm not, I'm a hate WhatsApp with a passion because I think, what, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think WhatsApp is, a, WhatsApp is, in my opinion, is it's an, a, an opinionated piece for parents to throw their opinion in. And I've never ever had a WhatsApp group. It's the first time we've ever had a WhatsApp group across the board for anything. I usually just send out a message and that's it. We train the same times every week and I'd usually send out a message or meeting on Saturday at X amount. That's it. Yeah. That, you, you, but that's where we are. We went on trips away. We've always had one that group, so that. But beyond that, we started watching. When, when it comes, it, yeah, when it we, comes to the training and all, you're not bothering. Everything about it, the Zoom calls, all that was like, it's been really, really positive from that point of view. But just that little bit, we should have done earlier. The younger kids have been great. The the, the smaller age groups, eight noise hands, they've done loads of stuff, which has been really, really positive. Some of the stuff they've done is great. But it's the same thing. It's it's that interaction. It's not the same thing. It, when someone comes on, they do something with it's it's funny or whatever. You just wonder what's 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 beyond that, you know? And you, as you go when you go training, you can see a kid and you can see how he feels and he doesn't have to stay at you, but you can see how how he goes and train and he's, he's all right sometimes when you see it in the video it's not the same you know yeah, yeah. and that's that's the bit you're missing that interaction you know so. 
well that's it yeah it's a very good point because you know they they can say you can read a lot from the body language that you won't pick up um and the mood and things like that and it's it's it is a challenge you know it's something that you as the coach you do need to try and keep on top of but you did make an excellent point there about nearly empowering the the young fellas um and you're giving them that sort of that say and to be able to say how they're seeing it and how they're looking at it because i think a lot of times coaches i know parents can be the bane of a coach's life and they all think they're jose Mourinho or pep Guardiola or jorgen klopp and they they'll be on the sidelines and I know it's an issue that like Allo and, and Hogar have come across and Alan I'm sure you're no different it it's something that they they think they know it all and sometimes coaches can fall into that trap as well and to to let the kids have their say you know to stand back and let them say that and to listen to what they're saying is very good because they do see things even at 14 they're seeing things from a different angle than what people of our own age or our own generation or Allo's generation was that bit older. Uh, you know, they see things a certain way. But um it's it it's it's just, you know, it's good to, to hear that. Um Gar, what about you with the technology? How are you? Yeah, same, about? same as we started using blue jeans the minute lockdown hit and then moved over to Zoom because a few other teams that asked me within the club could the lads join in. Obviously, you can expand up to 50 players on that, which yeah. we do. Which is fantastic look you know the only issue is you have lads coming off you hey wait what am i doing on that and the, the younger players so yeah. <laughs> it's, it's tougher on them but if we moved over to zoom we we've the lads are doing their strength and condition they're doing uh, we've always sort of asked the boys to give in feed in their own sort of coaching sessions as well so of a of a, a sack for the sheets here there's one there uh with lads training sessions that they've designed themselves so we usually give them 10 minutes at the end of the session to try and, as, as Alan has said, or Alan has said, to empower them a bit. And it's amazing, uh, as, as he's touched on, what they say are a, a different sort of coach. You know, where they're picking up stuff is unbelievable these days. And um, obviously, they've more, they've access to more technology than we ever did, I suppose. Um, and, you, and you know they're going onto YouTube and they're, and they're designing this little play that they want to do in a game or a free kick or whatever. And it's sensational, look, you know, with, we, we we sort of underestimate their mindset at times. Mm. Yeah, hugely, hugely. Um, we we just totally under you know, and uh, as coaches and I suppose error, the three of us can probably attest to it. We would have never had that. I'm sure you play Keith. We would have never had a coach come to us years ago and ask what 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 how the game went or how you played or how you think you played. It's very rare. You'd have been told you should have done this, should have that. You'd have been killed in, in a dressing room, more or less. But now it's different, so we are opening their minds up a bit. And you know, a lot of coaches have to take have to take credit for that, and they won't, in fairness. But yeah, we are, you know, as as the lads have said, empowering that bit more, like you know. Yeah, and the, the, we, we've set them a challenge now, Keith. Where yeah. with regards, obviously, the the lockdown restrictions have have opened up a bit. So we've a, an app called Heja, lads. I don't know if you don't know if you use it. But you can put little video clips and stuff in and now we've set them a challenge so there's a there's a bike challenge uh five and ten k there's a running challenge five and ten k there's and obviously as as alan as i know al has he's a, a few ga, a ga players as lad, as as lads do you know there's a lot of multi sports lads there so any exercise they do we give them a point for any runs they do we give them a couple more points for never is a voucher at the end of each month um but listen if it keeps them all active it keeps them all involved and, and it keeps them all fit and um, you're training them a different way as well yeah mm. which, which is true and we keep hearing about this being the new normal and how things are going to be going forward do you think this is something from your own point of view the technology side of it that you would carry forward you know if things were to go back to a semblance of normality in six months would you still think that you might look to to webinars as much or zooms or you know doing up these little sessions on the videos and all is it something that you think will carry into the new normal or the way forward do you think or let anyone jump in it's hard it's hard to it's hard to see if this is not a substitute for what we were doing already so you can't mm. substitute coaching with technology you can supplement you can supplement it and the same with teaching you can supplement it but real hands-on learning takes place in an environment that where everybody is present. Yeah. So, so if you think about the restrictions at the moment and the non-contact, so we 
we have a, a plan done now for non-contact from the 20th of July up to the 10th of August. So that's the time frame we've been given for non-contact training leading into full session, say. Now, you have an under eight team and they run up together and they haven't seen their pals for yeah. months on end. What's the first thing they're likely to do? Yeah. Less so, <laughs> yeah, technology can be great in one way, but it is, it, it's, it's, it's a natural physical barrier where kids come up and hug each other and nest and start. Yeah. Probably the lads over where I am in Crumlin, it wouldn't be a hug, it'd be more of a slap in the head or one of them type of things. But yeah. kids are going to be kids and no amount of technology is going to ever yeah. kind of get that out of them. So technology, I, I wouldn't like to see it become the new norm, if I'm being quite honest. I think it's great to supplement. At the end of the day, we're in a profession where we deal with humans. And yeah. not robots, not robots, you know. And kids are little humans are trying to learn. And, and the best way they learn is by the social interaction. It's a huge part of it, you know. Yeah, it's a huge thing that they're missing out on, isn't it? The social interaction. I mean, my own son is six and he's just missing, you know. So he's not paying his broadband bill. <laughs> he's not cycling fast enough on that bike that's powering or whatever it is he has under the table there. It's a one of them weirdos. <laughs> 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 it definitely is though as as Al said you could you could definitely use it as a, as an extra uh, yeah. bonus. Not, not not everyone has access to obviously you know conference rooms or cultural rooms yeah. where we've a big one down home farm but uh not everyone has that access in clubs obviously we but we've all traveled around clubs in dublin so if if you can add it as an hour's extra into you know your training week and obviously it suits the kids and, and parents wise it, it it's good and if you can do that session wise or if you can take stuff from from games in the premiership or your own games if you have that access it's definitely something you can definitely utilize um uh, and as, as i know it's not uh, something you're going to over rely on because you do need that uh, emphasis of you know being in front of them of, of them being around each other as well for as I touched on earlier their emotional intelligence as well and to help them grow yeah. just you know what uh, it's uh, it's just something you said there Alan and it, it hit home me there when you said when you have eight year olds and they all come together I was seven year old and last Monday was his first out in about six weeks and it was everyone's first out on the road and he was allowed out for his friends, right? Allowed out for two of his friends and they all knocked from and ended up top draw about twenty five minutes later and there's about twenty five of them in the group. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you know, brought him home, we brought him home, I said to him, like, listen, you have to think about this social distancing and all this kind of stuff. And he says to me, before you even start, I wasn't social distancing, so letting you know. So like what like what could it do? You know, I couldn't keep him back in now, so so right, we'll go on back here, but you have to think about what you're doing. But like, it's definitely going to play a part, Alan, because he, he like five minutes later, <laughs> went back up, and he, he was in the same position again. And it's very, it's very, for a seven-year-old or eight-year-old, yeah. that's very, very difficult. To, to so play. hard, yeah. yeah. And not, not only that, even to, to add context, even if, if, uh, I'm not sure if Home Farm or Malahoy have football for all sections or football for all teams. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a football yeah so. Like when we're talking about COVID-19 and talking about kids coming back to football, we're thinking mainstream. But we've we've 70 kids in a football for all section here. It's, it's one of the longest ones in the country. And we've to apply the same rules to kids that may have difficulty following the, uh, instruction at the best of time. So, like, I, I was speaking to the coach that run that the other day, and they're kind of worried now. They're kind of saying the younger kids that have, may have some learning difficulties how are we going to explain this big complex situation to them? They're just used to coming up and having fun and kicking about it. Yeah. You it's know, very, yeah. It's very difficult. It's another challenge, isn't it? Yeah. On the, just on the second point with technology, um, so we were talking about that is the, the, the stuff we would definitely bring forward is, we would definitely bring forward them doing their own, um, which we try to do anyway doing their own match analysis because it's something they can do if you have if if, if it's feasible to do it and if you have game for them to do their own match analysis and make their own points and come back with their own information we'll definitely be bringing that forward as we go forward between training and games and all that kind of stuff because 
the the information that you give them back is it kind of blows your mind of 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 what you're doing as a coach and, and where you are and where they are you know and um, right just let them do it and bring it back to you rather than the opposite way around so and I think the kids will appreciate that as well, you know, having that little input. And it might, you know, some kids will fall out of football. We've all seen it. Um, yeah. And getting getting them involved in that might keep an interest, you know, where they might not necessarily stick to playing, but they might look to go into coaching earlier or younger, you know. So it's it's anything to keep them involved. Because one of the biggest challenges is keeping, I know with my own son, it's keeping them away from the PlayStation and that. It's keeping them off Fortnite. It's keeping them... You know, trying to keep them keep them active. When you get your uh, lads back, now you've touched on uh, you know days for contact and all. How how challenging will it be with the social distancing element of it? Um, not necessarily just you know kids just coming in and having a little bit of a mess with each other, but when it comes to actual training and physical contact, is it something that you think will be an issue, or will it be? Will it just look after itself? You know, how far down the line is that before you can start getting kids back? Gar. I think we've been told sort of let well mid mid August is, is is what we've been told at the moment, isn't it? And then up up to then we've to have little four four, te- four group sessions. Uh, it's, I, I, uh, to be honest with you, Keith, I see it sort of phasing itself. To be honest with you, um, obviously with with huge policing from from mentors and coaches and managers alike, um, it's it's definitely something that I think, you know, we, we've we've all had an education through this. Um, as parents, as children, it's been huge for us all socially, and I think the kids are, are, are a dead weight to what's going on in fairness. And uh, you know, as far as Alan having a seven-year-old, it's it's tough. It's so so hard on them. And they think, Grant, get out of the house, see all the lads. It's going to be great. But with, with with some of the older lads, obviously me and Alan's thirteens, you know, that they'll be a bit more aware. So it, it, I think it all phases itself in. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Alan, what about yourself? Yeah, it's a strange one. Like the lad said, we're taking the contact out contact sports. So, yeah. like, it's it's a, it's a bit of a weird one. We kind of the, the very first thing we do done before we even looked at planning sessions for it, or we done a pack up for the coaches, like an education pack, and we said, look, this is how we're going to approach it. This is where the hand sanitizing stations are going to be. This is we get them session plans for basically how to space out their grids and all that. So we done all that, but before that happened, we had to appoint the COVID compliance officer in the club. That's 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 a, that's a, a new position in the club, and um, we had to do that. We had to talk to the child welfare officer as well, so about disclosing information. So, say for argument's sake, there was a, a parent with a, an underlying condition. Does that parent feel safe about coming to us and saying the reason my kid didn't go back to training is because we feel a bit fearful? And what are you going to do to allay that fear? What structures have you got in place? So we've done a pack for the parents to explain to them this is their thinking behind what we're doing this is the stages we're going to do it in and this is how we're going to do it and why we're going to do it and they've been given numbers for the compliance officer if they have any worries up here so even before we talk about football and stuff like that we've had to really yeah. look at all the health side of it and minimizing risk and, and hazard and that's that's it's not something yeah. we're used to doing but it's something we've had to become fairly adept at doing fairly quickly you know exactly yeah. and i'll i'll have more about yourself yeah, we we've done all the things that uh, Alan was talked about. We've we've all that kind of stuff in place. The, the one the only thing that we need to prepare for is, is actually uh, is what do you deal with someone actually comes back positive and how the club deals with that. Because yeah. it, it across the board, everyone is doing you know all that kind of stuff. Hand sanitizer, you know, social distance, all that kind of stuff. But the, the real problem is going to be when someone comes back and says, "Listen, my son is." COVID positive or link. How do you deal with that? What do you deal with? Do you lock down the club? Do you lock down the training? It's it's how you deal with that, I think, is is, is really because all the other stuff everybody is doing, you know, across the board. It's very little to to, to, to deal with. Right, Johnny has it's COVID. What do you do now? You know, who contact you? How do you break that down? You stop training completely. Is everyone not allowed to go training for two weeks? Is that, that's what we think needs to be nailed down more than all the other stuff we, you know. So. Does yeah. it go back to the start? Does it go back to the start again, Alan? Where you know, as 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 you all know, that school uh, that had the the first case was right beside us. Um, yeah. the kids on in that year, um, mm. that team immediately got wiped out that week uh, because they were all told 
stay, stay yeah. away. And then as as, as the, the next week grew, obviously there was another uh, uh, kid in that school. Uh, another team was wiped out. So does does that all start spoiling out again? They go, oh, Jesus. I think that's, that's <laughs> essentially why we have a, a football board and all that kind of stuff that needs to go down that specific information of, of exactly what happens or what you do when the situation arises because i think at the minute everyone is, everyone is doing the precautionary things and you know doing the right things in their club every club is doing you can see across the board it's next what happens when something when this actually happens you know actually, it's actually a very good it's a very good point alan has made it the coaches are going like there's committees in clubs to look after certain aspects of their own of the club so if the coaches are coming back to train you might actually have coaches coming back with a little bit of trepidation. Yeah. What am I stepping there? What? <laughs> like, if, like, if I get sick, I'm out of work, let's say. You know, you've got all that yeah. kind of thing going on. And do I get paid? And, you know, what are the risks? Am I insured? Am I not insured? So you've yeah. all that going on. So I think the main thing is that coaches feel confident and confident when they do go back to the club. There. It's going to support them. They're going to be educated as regards what to do. And that these are the risks. These are the hazards. And, like, I suppose the elephant in the room, lads, is we don't know. Are we going to go through the phases in the fashion that the government are saying? We don't know if there is going to be a safe yeah. way with the workers. Yeah. We're basing everything we're being told to do on the best outcome. Yeah, you know, so that, yeah. that's probably the elephant in the room at the minute when it comes to the to the, to the grassroots side of things. You know. Exactly. I've been told, ah, look, is I ready to go back? Everything's hunky dory, but it's not going to be hunky dory, and it's it's going to throw up challenges. How do you deal with them challenges? You know, how do you, as you, as you've said, you know, one player comes. I'm not even a player. Could be a coach. Could be anyone. Could be anyone involved in the club. Could carry in the virus, and then it can spread, and then you're taking out teams. Um, it's 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 a an unknown. Um, entity of I, how I this is all going to happen it's not the player in, in the kid it's it's someone's mother is a nurse mm. or someone's mother is a doctor yeah was, they're walking in with these people and that's always the element i think beyond it it's it's not the normal joe so it's it's always going to be of somebody who works with them you know how do you deal with that you know because they're going to be at a much higher risk let's be honest then than any of the rest of us getting this. How do we deal with these? What's the situation? What's the protocol for dealing with these people? That's, yeah. you know, everyone has all the protocols in case, but nobody has, right, here's the situation. What what happens when this when this person comes to me and says, mm. listen, which is going to happen, let's be honest, you know, from what the well, numbers are. Sometimes it takes uh, an association like the FA, like if, if, say if, if Alan has his way of dealing with it, he's being told by his committee and Gar has, and, and we have our way, they could be three totally different ways of dealing with it. Yeah, exactly. One out, one out of those three could be right, the other two could be wrong. So unless we have someone like the FAI saying, here you go, lads, this, you're going to be mandated to act this way in the event of a case. Yeah. We're basically making that's, our own. Yeah. That's essentially what I'm saying. Until that comes out of, right, this is how you deal with it. Right, this is where you go. This is what this is the process. You, you This is the protocol we want everyone to follow. I think then everyone is comfortable going back and what we're doing. Otherwise, it's everyone has all the, the pre protocols in place. Beyond that, I think we need more information, you know, of what yeah. we do around it, you know. And Absolutely. that was my next question was was around that has there been any instructions from the FAI or from above, like of how you deal with this? But clearly there's not. It it looks like you are all just your own club will have your own directives and you know it, it it's in some ways it is a recipe for disaster you know so do, do you think there will be directive coming at some stage from the FAI about this or will it these failures will be left as our own make his our own sort of rules as it goes I, I don't know I think I don't think I, I don't think it, I think what the clubs are waiting on is from the FAI I don't think clubs are in a situation to take it on board themselves or to just be ad hoc about it. I think clubs are waiting on this is exactly what the protocol is because we're, we're all under the FEOI guidelines. So yeah. until they come forward and say, this is how you've got to approach it, then everyone is just going to sit in their hands because everyone's afraid to make a mistake. That's the reality. You know, and you can see why, in fairness, but everyone is afraid to make a mistake. So you need to kind of that governing body to come forward and say, yeah. this is how we want this is how we want to go and take it from here. I think then, it, it, I think a lot of has come out is one of the 
one body's contradicted the other about timelines and all this kind of stuff. I think we just need a, a, a strong plan to go forward. This is how we deal with this situation. And then we all need to get behind it, essentially. Yeah. That's what we need to do, you know? So I think with left of the clubs, everyone will have a different idea. I think that's the problem. You know? Exactly. And if you're a club that's that's got three other clubs in it's in the same area and you have three different plans and parents are then getting involved because oh well uh you know in gar's case you know well belvo are doing this or stella maris are doing that or kevin's are doing that and you know if if it's different all singing off a different hymn sheet well then it, it is a bit of a pointless exercise and a recipe for disaster so hopefully there will be some something to sort of guide everyone because there is going to be a lot of fear you know it's unprecedented times that we're sort of in and i think the, everyone's afraid to make the first move or take the first step and it's getting back into the normality or as much as possible that we can get back into is going to be a, a challenge in itself now which is ourselves um these find it a struggle um to to keep the kids and the parents i know you just spoke about it but have you had much feedback with parents of the kids and the teams you are looking after? Um, has, has there been buy-in from the parents to what you are looking to do or has it been quiet on that front? Uh, Allo? Uh, predominantly, I find the parents have been really good. I mean, if anything that's going to come from it, and I said there will be positives, it will be kind of, I'm not saying we don't get recognition in the grassroots, but there'll be a recognition of the part that we play in terms of yeah. how big a part we play in children's lives, in terms of the, 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 the sport and output side of things, um, participation, having the outlet for kids. I mean, if you think about it this year alone, there's kids that should have made a confirmation that haven't, a communion that haven't, that exams that won't. The one constant through it all has been their football clubs. No, mm -hmm. no matter what happens to football, their sport is always there for them, no matter what happens, yeah. you know. Um, so... We're going to be picking up the pieces from that on there on our end, but in terms of parents buying in, yeah, we've had nothing but positives from parents in terms of look when we come back, tell us what you want us to do. Is there any, they took part in all the home challenges, and um, we've had parents volunteer. We've had a graphic designer volunteer to do stuff for free for the club. Um, our child welfare officer is the welfare officer for Palo Hospital, so that's that's a free service as well. So we've. We've literally had parents come and say, what can we do to help, you know, which has been really good. That, that's one massive positive, I'd say, on, on our end, you know. Yeah, excellent. And Alan, what about yourself? Very, very, very similar to Alan, in fairness. We, we've, we've buy in from a lot of people in, um, across the board in terms of what they're doing for the club. And, you know, a lot of people have still done a lot more inside the club. And there's a lot more kind of community around the club that been more involved in it essentially um, which probably hadn't been in, involved in it enough up to that point so that, that's that been a positive essentially from inside the club you know they have done a lot I mean every club has done something for charity and, and we've done the same so I think there's been a lot of positives as well like you know to take from it you know so. yeah it, it's excellent you know it's, it, it, clubs are doing their best to, to to get the kids through and you made a great point there Allo, that you know it, well you're not you're not looking for a pat on the back and a gold star you know it does have to be sort of commended that the work that coaches of the, these kids do i mean i know Allo has had issues and i know gar has had issues with you know joyriders um damaging facilities you know obviously are playing pitches and uh things like that and i'm sure alan you've come across this as well um you know keeping the kids interested and keeping the kids giving them that sort of base and that that area that he can go to to keep them playing you know it's such a big resource to a lot of areas and a lot of disadvantaged areas as well and you just hate to see um that sort of falling away now when you're looking at kids as they're getting older is it more of a struggle to keep them involved and around this whole lockdown um with the older lads so Alan you're looking for the 14s is it in Malahoy 14 Gard is 13s and Alan you're looking after the whole spectrum is it in Lords so they're they're at that age is finding it difficult to the older kids to keep them sort of on the straight and narrow during this have you been you know touching base as much with them or can you see a few maybe falling 
through a few of them cracks uh, and how would you deal with that gar if you look uh, as, as the lads will know historically over the last few years 16s 17s is a really really hard age where you get lads obviously dropping off you've got you know so social things hit the mindset and, and young ladies as well and and they generally drift yeah. it's, it's a known fact but if you look now if if the lads obviously we're, we're lucky we're getting involved and Al oversees the whole lot of it i think this this itself and what's happened in the last couple of months it might see a little, a little change in some of their mindsets where where you know they might have missed it a, a, a bit you know there might have been that you know that urge, you know, when you step away from it, and we all know we've all stepped away from football, and, yeah. and then the urge to step back into it. But this might be the thing that sets them 16, 17 year olds and go, oh, hold on a minute, I'm not giving no football. Yeah. Um, Cause I'll end up like in that situation, sitting around doing nothing. Well, uh, yeah, it, like Gar says, it, it's a challenging age group because it, the guys kind of, what I see tend to happen at the, the 11 or so I think that's 16 is that if they're not playing for a kind of a premier, let's call it a premier team or a major team, or one of the lower league teams, and they're not doing so well middle of the season, maybe they just decide this is not here. And you see squads kind of depleted in that way. So what we've tried to do to combat it is we get them signed up to some early coach education and we have them coach some of the eights in the academy. Um, that kind of gives them a little bit more involvement in the club. We give them a bit of kick. We pay for it. A couple of coach head badges to get them involved and that seemed to have given them a little bit it's 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 given them that autonomy and that accountability to say i'm not just a player here i'm actually a, a coach of one of the little teams so yeah. even if they're not having such a good time on the playing side of it they could be really enjoying the coaching if they're not enjoying the coaching so much the playing could be going well so it's given them another outlet to tie them into the club to let them know look lads we're here for you beyond your playing time because we only have you up to 18 or 19 and then you're you're off in senior football or league world or whatever yeah. so we try and do as much beyond that but we do it at the age of 16 anticipating that they will leave the club eventually to try and keep them here if we can just to retain them you know excellent and yourself alan out in malahoy it is a uh, much the same it, well uh, just when alan just said that with the 16s malahoy had a policy of making the uh 16s coach the academy kids on a saturday morning um, and they do something very similar where they, they bring them in, in and do the kick start for any kids that want to want to be involved uh, I think they start at 16s, it's one of the 16s age group. There's usually three or four teams at every age group. But I think they bring the 16s in. There's usually about, out of, out of three teams they have, there's usually about 20 kids who come down and help out with the academy. And they do a kickstart one or kickstart two for them, try and kick them along into that. I think beyond that, when they go into 17s and 18s, it's a difficult age group to try and re-engage them, to keep them involved within the club. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had, uh, three or four senior teams and it kind of worked out because the kids who weren't playing in first team football were playing in even at 70s or 80s were still playing a second team or tour team there was somewhere for them to go in senior football so when they went and played 70s and 80s there so was still somewhere for them to go and play in senior football it wouldn't have been the highest level but they could still all go and play as a group for yeah. four team and i think the tour team is back up and running now but the four team is gone but it's difficult to see that progression for them. I think when you get to 70 and there's no progression, you don't see where we're going to be and we're still going to have a team. That's the difficult bit to keep them engaged, you know, because as you say, they're, they're beginning to go out chase or whatever, you know, or deal with yeah. it, you know, whatever. And, you know, if they can see a football side in two years' time, that's a difficult process, you know, but it's something that we, we definitely need to address yeah. because a lot of these teams who pop up, who are in different towns or different villages who are, you know, who are, I don't know, I don't know teams in Lewis or teams around the whole farm, but it might be in, in Malahoy, they've, they've different teams who are not Malahoy, but they're essentially all the kids who did play in it, but there's just no team there from the place. So they go off and set up their own team mm -hmm. and they make their own club and all this kind of stuff. But it's those kids who need to kind of re-engage to keep them involved. If that team was there and it wasn't the first team or a second or third team and they still had somewhere to go, I think that's the kind of ideal situation, but that older age group is very difficult to engage, and it, it really is, you know. Yeah. Not playing that level of football, you know. Yeah. I think what, what, what is a touch on that? There, sorry for cutting across you, Keith. No, you're fine. The, this new sort of structure that hopefully we we come across within the FEI 
there's also a, a huge huge window for these at the moment to to touch on them few age groups 16 17s and, and really really enforce coach education and you know keep them involved and give give them different structures i suppose if it comes to aspects of learning or, or, or little study things as well in regards of giving them uh, something different outside if they don't go to college that they will have you know the looks of coaching badges the lads the lads have touched on like you know a lot of these clubs pay for that through, through their own covers and you know not not a lot of clubs in dublin have to have the money these days to do that as well don't forget coaching education is not cheap no there is a there is an, an opportunity to you know to educate a lot of these lads who who we do lose from the game at, at these ages as well i think there's That's a lot it. more though gareth beyond coaching you know now you look at social media and all that kind of stuff yeah that, that younger generation is a much better generation to look after social media and clubs and help out and all that so because they're a lot lot better than, yeah. than my age group anyway so you know those kind of kids are much much better to get involved in all that kind of stuff you know so there's a lot more involved in football than just i'm a coach in my community club there's loads of stuff you can do beyond yeah yeah inside the club you know that you can still be involved with that club and involved with your mates and not be a coach but do different things inside the club yeah, you know, yeah. coaching you know and sometimes you need the clubs to to sort of embrace that you know some clubs don't and you know they they it's too late and you can see they don't have social media presence or they don't have you know a, a younger sort of influence throughout that club um sort of running things <laughs> uh with the, the 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 lockdown now you might see some of these kids that were starting to drift might just this might get them back in you know because i think everybody's itching and chomping at the bit to be back around their mates back around lads back kicking a ball and it might just be something that that gets the you know it might be a positive to come from this that some of those lads that were going to fall through the cracks might just get back involved yeah. and even if it is on the social media side or if it is just in any involvement as you said it doesn't have to be as a player it doesn't even have to be as a coach there's other ways that they'll keep involved with that club and if you have them from you know eight nine up until 17 and 18 there's a chance you know that they will you know want to do something and want to help out so i suppose it does give give it an opportunity for these sort of things and it's it's something that i suppose clubs have to think about as well put their hats on and say you know what can we do to help them you know and yous are all on top of it yous are all like good clubs there that that can do these sort of things but it is a is a challenge now another thing i wanted to talk about <clears throat> was do you see again moving to the upper echelons of the age groups now and the sort of talent pool nearly that can you see any sort of impact on chill kids that would be looking to move to england or move you know into maybe not league of Ireland, but you know the the kids that had a chance at going to england can you see this impact in their development or is it just a case of when it's ready to go it'll go or could you see you know the the teams looking to take on lads from Ireland or whatever will will they not be looking as much or will they have missed the missed an opportunity does anyone have an opinion on that sort of side of it but don't forget, lads, we've got this real, this Brexit thing coming in as well that, that is going to stop a lot, uh, you know, it's more or less put the kibosh on that. So in terms, it's only going to help our own National League uh, yeah. to a point well. Now, unfortunately, you know, we're all in a situation, we've all had conversations with parents that just all they say is, is dollar signs and, and that's not the way it should be. But, you, you know, it's very hard with some parents to explain to step away from that because they see the dollars all over social media they see everything what these players earn etc but there is going to be you know a, a big stop on you know players going abroad so i think clubs will have to look to the looks of iceland hello has a uh, has an iceland, yeah. an iceland there. We'll, we'll start sending the lads over there <laughs> but that's that's the thing isn't it it is a challenge to um to placate some of these parents and i know um is it's not about producing players to go to england you know it's about kids having fun and seeing their development to go through and when it gets to that stage you, you want to do everything you can to help a child or a young adult at that stage maybe but it is the parents that can be 
that can be the the main obstacle you know so if you had let's say Allo, you had a lad at your club and he was being looked at and now it's probably gone on ice and then with the brexit thing coming down the line do you feel it'd be a tricky situation or can you just see he'll just get on with it and just keep playing or you might move towards League of Ireland or what way could you see it going? Do you think there'll be any imp impact on these kids or is it just going to be a natural progression nearly? Being quite honest, I think Gary had a very good point there. I think I think the Brexit thing will have a much bigger uh, effect on the business end of things than, than Cope ever will. Um, if we talk about players going to England, a lot of it is down to fortune and good luck and circumstance. Like, like we talk about talent and we talk about coaching and we're coaches, we're not fortune tellers. Uh, I think sometimes some of us think we're fortune tellers and yeah. force the coaches second. Um, we have a coach here at the club who, who would have been a pretty good league world and fair play to you, pay Tony Sheridan, has their 12s, 14s. And um, Tony himself will tell you, he, 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 if you want to call it talent, he'd everything. He, he, he'd everything himself. And whether it be fortune, uh, yeah, whether it be circumstances, fortune, luck, call it what you will. There's a million other things beyond what a player can do in that snapshot of time when he goes to England that's going to affect the outcome of whether he stays there, goes there, lands at yeah. the right club or the wrong club. Like if you look at presently, if the Irish under 17s, it's a 50 50 split with home based players. You have air under 19s, there's only a quarter of those are where home based in the last squad. But you look at our 15s, there's 18 out, 18 out 20 players are home based. So we're making that shift towards retaining them within the League of Ireland structures, which I won't go into the, on the 13 side of it, but from 15s up, I think the concept is quite good. And I think if we can give their players the same type of education, the same standard of coaching that they're going to get in the UK, why move them from a home environment where they're quite happy? Yeah. You know, exactly. and if they, go, if they go to a professional club and they're in their early 20s, well, then maybe they may have matured that little bit. I mean, some of the coaches here are fantastic. The guys you have on here, are obviously, the dad top clubs. The Alan's on is a, is a license at the moment. The, there seems to be this misconception that because you're a UK based coach, that you're getting some different kind of coaching than you're going to get here, a different standard and quality. Yeah. Some outstanding coaches, in Northern, from the grassroots into the League of Ireland, some, some amazing coaches. And my own opinion, as contentious as it may be, is that I'd like to see players stay here longer and be exposed and we develop a coach education structure and a coaching structure that leans more towards a professional standard of coaching as the kids go into those environments. Excellent, excellent stuff. And what about you, Alan? I think Gareth's point is 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 huge about the Brexit thing coming down the line. I think that's that's probably the, the major issue for all kids going away uh, in the future. In, in terms of does this affect them, I think this is just a, it's a break stop for everyone. You know, yeah. I think if he was good enough for eight, eight, ten or three months ago, he's not good enough in, to go now. I think the the problem you're gonna have is, is that Brexit thing coming down the line. It's 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 something that Alan touched on is is you know, if you could get kids to stay here longer in a better environment, I think it would be better for everybody, you know. Um the league, everything grasps the whole lot. Like I just think we have a great time, a great period of time now to have a reset. To make everything a lot better for everybody across the board and i just think I, I hope that we don't miss we don't miss the chance to change in a crisis you know we should never let a crisis go to waste and i, I think this is there's never a better time for the feo to make it to make a change across the board for everybody you know to make skill by football league of Ireland, all that elite section a hell of a lot better for everybody you know so that's what i that see that's true. I mean, it is a, a period of um, uncertainty in any way with the FAO and it's, you know, if if they had that sort of forward thinking, it is a chance to nearly go and start again and rip it up and look at how they're doing things currently and how they can improve and how they can encourage that sort of um, development at home. You know, as, as Alo pointed out, the level you know, if you have a UEFA A license here, it's as good as a UEFA A license in the UK. If you have a B license here, it's as good as a B license there. You know, it's it, there is a snobbery around that. And as Gar pointed out earlier, it's sometimes parents are just seeing my son dollar signs, get them over there, 
the prestige of playing for Liverpool, let's say, or Aston Villa or Man United, we leave nobody out. But the, the prestige of playing for those clubs, and you can, nine times out of ten, kids are getting swallowed up when they're going over there. Yeah. Because they're probably not ready. You but know, they're yeah. not ready. Not only, only yeah. that, key. Sorry, yeah. but, um, if you think, I'd go back three, four years ago, I was, I was working for a club in the northeast of England, I won't be unkind to mention, but they, they, they were asking us to look for a left full back player at the age of 14, 15, okay? Now, on the current legislation regards scouting or, or talent ID in that domain is that a parent would either have to move over yeah. with, with the child, or if it's an EU to an EU country, that's fine, the parent, the parent can move once they can provide the same standard of education. Now, what the club told us is that we found the player, we, we, we had him go over, and they said, the problem we have at the moment is, it's, it, as a business, it's not viable because we can find a player exactly like him in our local, local community that we don't have to provide accommodation for. So it's actually coming down to brass tax with clubs in the UK now. That, a lot of it is that that's why they won't look. And post-COVID, post-Brexit, money and football clubs yeah. are going to be a big, big thing. Yep. Exactly. And if they can source players locally, they, they won't even cast an eye over here. Yeah. Hello, we've already lost a couple of academies over the last few years in the lower leagues in regards to the UK. You're probably going to see some teams hit the wall like Barry over the next probably season yeah. with what's going on, with, you know, TV deals and everything's going to go, you know, tits up, excuse the term. It, it, it's going to be, you know, a lot of uncertain times for, for lower league teams in, in the UK. And uh, as for the gap or the window for players to go over from or into the UK, um, as you've just touched on there, is spot on, you know, financially, they'll go and look for someone down the road rather than go over, come over here and look for some. Yeah, we do. We kind of forget the money end of it, don't we? Unfortunately, yeah. that's, that's what it is. At some point, it is a commodity. They, they look at children as commodities and that's the unfortunate reality of it sometimes, you know? Yeah. It really is, you know, and it's it's something that hasn't been in focus. And, you know, usually the, the local talent are probably being overlooked at certain clubs. But you, you mentioned Berry going to the wall and Bolton were in trouble as well. But Aston Villa, for example, Man United's books came out the other day. You know, it's it's top teams as well. The, the money impact of the COVID is going to hit everybody. And, you know, it, I think sometimes maybe... It, people have to get their heads out of the sand and just concentrate on what's best for the the player, the kid, and just let them develop that way. Now, whether that's in the League of Ireland or whether it's with a local club or whether it's, you know, it, it's not the be-all and end-all getting over to England. <clears throat> but it's it's been an interesting chat, lads. Um, <clears throat> I've taken up a lot of years of time tonight. A lot of technical faults on this, but sure, we'll, we'll manage, we'll get through. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for giving me that time and for talking. It was a really interesting chat to hear from you about uh, schoolboy football and your own challenges through this. And um, thanks very much. So, Alo, thanks for, thanks for coming on. It was a I pleasure. Hope I, wasn't, hope I wasn't too uncomfortable doing a Liverpool pod. You didn't mention it too much, in fairness. I tried not to. I, I tried not to. Um, I could have been a lot worse, you know, because I, what I could have done was I could have done something like this and put the logo up the side of the head. <laughs> but I said I wouldn't. I said okay. I won't do that. I'm not like that. Uh, but now, listen, seriously, thanks for coming on. I know you're a busy man and uh, it's it's really it's really great. great to have you on. Enjoy it. Um, enjoy the lads as well. Two good lads. Thanks, so. Alan. Alan, thanks as well for coming on as well. The same thing, you know, giving up your time to come on here. As I said, we've joked about it, a Liverpool podcast, but it's good to get, you know, club sort of allegiances away and just to hear about how you guys sort of look at coaching of, of children. So thanks very much for that. Yeah, no problem. It's a pleasure. Good stuff. And Gar, we'll hear from you again. You're a regular, you know, but thanks again. You know, it's it's another busy man. I know you are running around today. You are going here, there and everywhere with, with meetings and things like that. So to, to get on, it was it was good to have you. Thanks, Pat. So no problem at all. So we'll wrap it up there. It's been a Fatback 4 special on Underage Soccer and I hope you all enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Take care. Cheers. Thanks, lads. Thanks, lads.